Okay, so now look at the transport of carbon dioxide in the blood. Basically, we have three ways okay, to transport the CO2 in the blood. Okay, so the most direct way is the dissolution directly into the blood. So it means the CO2 dissolve in the blood plasma. But again, because CO2 is not really well dilute okay, or dissolved in the blood, so therefore roughly about 5% only okay, dissolution directly into the blood. So another way is the binding to the hemoglobin. Now, when they bind to the hemoglobin, uh, CO2, actually they do not bind to the heme group. In fact, they bind to the polypeptide change of the hemoglobin, forming this carbabino hemoglobin. So from the word carbabino, carba means carbon, amino. So it means that they bind to the end terminus of the hemoglobin. Are you clear? So it means that the, 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 the hemoglobin, so they bind to the polypeptide change of the hemoglobin. So forming this carba amino, can you see that? Carbamino. So it means that it's carbon. Okay, carbon dioxide bind to the amino acids of the hemoglobin, so which is the N terminals. Okay, so again, it's not a lot, about 10% only. So, in fact, the majority of this um, carbon dioxide actually will be converted to hydrogen carbonate, or we term it as bicarbonate ion, which is HCO3 minus. Okay, so majority of CO2 can be transported or are transported in this form, which is a very, very effective form for us to carry and transport the CO2. Because if it depends on these, uh, these solutions and carbabino hemoglobins, we only take about like 15% and eh, total up for these, uh, these solutions directly into the blood and also formation of carbabino hemoglobins it will take about 15% only. So it means that the remaining 85% have to depend on this bicarbonate ion or hydrogen carbonate ions, okay? So let us look at what actually take place during the process, okay? What actually take place during the process of the conversion. Okay, now let's say this is a respiring tissue, right? And a respiring tissue here. So we have the muscle cell. Okay, the tissues. Yeah, our muscle can contract. Okay, this is our muscle. Okay, then you can see that at the muscle here, your tissue fluid, and then you have the blood capillary. So this is a blood capillary. So inside the blood capillary, then okay, this is tissue fluid. Okay, this is inside the, the blood capillary. So inside blood capillary, we have the red blood cell. Okay, so red blood cell. So muscle cells carry out aerobic respiration. Always remember, it must be aerobic respiration. Eh? Only aerobic respiration in mammal produce CO2, eh? and aerobic won't produce, right? Okay, so when it produces CO2, now CO2 actually release. Okay, into the tissue fluid, and it, first way it can dissolve. Okay, enter into the. Can you see that? Enter into the blood capillary. So first way, dissolve directly. Okay, dissolve in blood plasma. So this one roughly about five percent. Or they can enter into the red blood cell. When they enter into the red blood cell, okay, so it can combine with hemoglobin. So it means that CO2 combined with the hemoglobin form, okay, carbabino hemoglobin. Okay, it form carbabino hemoglobin. Okay, now this one take about 10% only, not the main one. Are you clear? These two, not the main one. So let us look at the main ones, okay? How these bicarbon ions can be formed. Okay, so first of all, you can see that this CO2 will react with water, okay? So CO2. 
Okay, let me remove this. Do I interfere with my word? So CO2 react with water. Okay, yeah, this CO2 react with water. So this is a reversible process. So the enzyme is called carbonic anhydrase. Eh? Carbonic anhydrase that we have uh, learned about this before. So this carbonic anhydrase have the very high turnover number. So per carbonic anhydrase, they can actually catalyze 600,000 of the reactions and convert the substrate into the product within one second. Okay, so what happened here? So you form carbonic acid, H2CO3. But H2CO3 is not stable. Because they are unstable, this H2CO3 now dissociated okay, into the H plus and HCO3 minus. Can you see that? So this is how the bicarbonate ions is formed. Are you clear? So H2CO3, can you see that H2CO3? Dissociated into the H plus and HCO3 minus, which is a bicarbonate ion. So these bicarbonate ions now will release into the blood plasma. But the thing is, if we continuously to release the bicarbonate ion, can you see that the cell actually losing the negative ions, correct? So to balance the charge here, to balance the charge, then you can see that in exchange, to balance the charge, huh? so in exchange, we have the chloride shift. So chloride ions now move into the cells to balance the charge so that the cells won't actually lose too much of charge or become polarized in this case. Are you clear? Okay. Now, the main issue, uh, the main thing okay, that we're going to discuss here is the H plus ion. Now, because free H plus, okay, I understand. Huh? So, we say free proton. Free proton, they actually will cause the acidity to the cell. How we call acidity to the cells? By lowering the pH. Are you clear? So with the more and more H plus uh, ions present inside the red blood cell, you're going to lower down the pH of the red blood cell. And it's very, very dangerous. So in order to reduce the free H plus, now H plus now can bind with the hemoglobin. Okay. H plus need to bind the hemoglobin to form hemoglobinic acid. Or HHB. Are you clear? Hemoglobin have to bind to the uh, H plus so that you reduce the number of free H plus. When you bind to the H plus, H plus now no longer free moving. So when it, it's bound form, it won't cause the lowering down of the pH. Right? right. If a pure hydrochloric acid, it won't give us any change in the pH because they are pure. But when it dissociated, then you have the H plus. H plus is the one that gives us the trouble. Okay, so H plus are going to bind with the hemoglobin as uh, hemoglobins to form the hemoglobin acid, but there is a term and condition. What is the term and conditions? Term and conditions say that here HB have to release HBO8 have to release oxygen first. So that this Hb now can bind to H plus. So indirectly, you can see that H plus actually lower down the affinity of hemoglobins for oxygen. Can you see that? So remember yesterday we talked about the ball effect. The ball effect actually because of what? Because eh, we see that from the graph, from the experiment, we see that the graph now shifted to the right. When the graph shifted to the right, means that affinity decreased, correct or not? Okay, so compare back what we have learned yesterday now. In the previous lesson, so this is a percentage saturations. This is a partial pressure of O2. So under normal conditions, you can see that we have the sigmoid curve. But when the partial pressure of the is normal, 
PCO2. But when the partial pressure of O2 is high, you can see the graph shifted to the right. Okay, so this one is with the high partial pressure of CO2. So shifted to the right. When shifted to the right, we check at the two kilopascal here. You can see that initially is about 20% of the saturations now become roughly about 10%. So means that you have the extra release. So means that O2 release. more readily why o2 release more readily because the affinity of hemoglobin for o2 decreases cannot when affinity decrease means that hemoglobin don't like o2 anymore if don't like o2 release o2 are you clear can i see that so more effect didn't state why more effect just show that there is an extra release of the o2 from the oxyhemoglobin and show that affinity of hemoglobins for oxygen actually decreases. Can I see that? But why? Why this uh, thing or this phenomenon actually take place? It's because of the transportations of CO2. Because if you look at this, the transportation of CO2, we have three ways, correct or not? So first way forming, I mean, or dissolve in the blood plasma. Second way form carbabino hemoglobin. But these two are not the main uh, the pathway for CO2 to be transported to, to the lung. So it means that CO2 have to react with the ox uh, water to form the carbonic acid, which is not stable. And the enzyme that involved here is the carbonic anhydrase. And this carbonic anhydrase catalyze the reactions to form this uh, by, uh, sorry, the carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is not stable, dissociated into the H plus and HCO3 minus. So this HCO3 minus we call as a bicarbonate ion or hydrogen carbonate ions. So this hydrogen carbonate ion or bicarbonate ion now uh, uh, move out to the uh, tissue, uh, sorry, to the blood plasma and dissolve in the blood plasma. But the thing here is we have to exchange it with the chloride. So this is termed as chloride shift. Okay. But the main problem here is the H plus. So H plus, what's the role of H plus here? H plus actually. Okay, will cause the acidity inside the red blood cell by lowering down the pH, correct not? Okay, with the more H plus ions, then we can see that the pH decreases. Okay, this is very, very dangerous to the cells. Then hemoglobinic uh, acid have to be formed by reacting this H plus with the, the proton with the hemoglobin. Okay, so the question here is, when H, uh, H plus want to bind to the hemoglobin, hemoglobin have to release the O2. So therefore, it depends on how many H plus ion. The more H plus ion we have, the more decrease in terms of the affinity. If you look at the correlations here, what's the correlation? We look at this. Huh? First, you want to increase the release of O2 from oxyhemoglobin. You want to increase. So therefore, we need to increase the concentration of the H plus, correct or not? When concentration H plus increase, means that I can increase the rate. Because why? Because the H plus decreases the affinity of hemoglobin for O2. So therefore, there's an extra release. But how to increase? Okay, uh, I write again. How to increase the H plus concentration? we increase the concentrations of CO2 or partial pressure of CO2. So the more CO2 I have, the more hemo... Uh, I'll put it this way, this is already skip one step. Okay. So in order to have more protons, therefore we need to have more carbonic acid, which is not stable. Cannot. To have more carbonic acid means that we have more CO2 or partial pressure of CO2 increases. So can you see that the correlations now? When the CO2 concentration is high, okay, sorry, concentration of CO2 is high, therefore, this one also high, proton concentration is high, so with a higher positive right? proton concentrations, therefore, they will decrease the affinity of the hemoglobins for 
O2. So therefore, there is a release of O2, more O2 from oxyhemoglobin. So this is basically answer the question, okay, why this ball effect take place, okay? So what actually happens in the lung? So the reverse reaction actually take place. Now, what's mean reverse reaction? Now, look at this. Huh? So first, okay, so hemoglobinic acid dissociated now in the lung, okay, because partial pressure O2 is high. So dissociate now, okay, because O2 need to bind the hemoglobin. So it means that we get the H plus and hemoglobin. So this hemoglobin now is free, right? So this hemoglobin is now can take oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin so in the lung. Okay, so step number one. Step number two, okay, bicarbonate ions now. Okay, bicarbonate ions now return. into red blood cell. So what they do? So these bicarbonate ions react with the, is that react with the bicarbonate ions, okay, sorry, bicarbonate ions react, react with the protons to form, okay, H2CO3, which will dissociate now into CO2 plus H2. So this CO2 now can diffuse out of red blood cell and then continue until we, I mean, the ex, uh, exhalation takes place and then go into the alveolus. And then we can actually remove them. Okay, from the lung through the ventilations. Okay. Huh? So this is what actually happened inside the lung. The reverse process actually took place. Okay, so the equilibrium now forced the CO2 to be formed and CO2 will be excreted out, okay, or will be uh, removed out from our lung, okay? Now let us look at these uh, activity 6.14, carbon dioxide transportations. So in this case, we have the gas exchange and respiring tissues, as I said that, you can see that we can dissolve this CO2. Can you see that? CO2 dissolve in the blood plasma, about 5%, forming carbabino hemoglobin. Okay, forming carbabino hemoglobin, about 10%. The most one actually forming the bicarbonate ions. Okay, forming bicarbonate ions. How? So CO2 react with water under this catalysis of the enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. So this carbonic anhydrase Okay, combine CO2 and H2O to form the carbonic acid, which is not stable, dissociated into the H plus and can you see that dissociated H plus, okay, uh, and also bicarbonate ion, bicarbonate ion remove out, so chloride ion enter to balance the charge here, okay, then H plus, what happened to H plus? H plus will bind to the hemoglobins to form the hemoglobinic acid where O2 now is released for the cells. Can you see that? So the reverse process take place inside the lung where the soft CO2 can actually diffuse eh? and also these uh, dissociations of the CO2 from the hemoglobins again diffuse back into the lung and the reverse process can you see that chloride ion move out, bicarbonate ion move in, bicarbonate ion react with the H plus. So who released the H plus? Hemoglobinic acid released the H plus. Okay and then oxygen now react with the, the remaining hemoglobins to form the HbO2 and continue to get HbO8. And then what will happen here? So H plus combined with the bicarbonate ion to form this carbonic acid. Again, the reactions, same enzyme carbonate anhydrase. So we form water and CO2. Now CO2 can actually release to the lung, okay? So take five minutes to complete the passage, okay? By uh, using the given them. Okay, so assume that you guys have done. Now we're going to uh, discuss the answer here. So first, carbon dioxide is more soluble in blood than consider the oxygen. Okay, so but even though they are soluble, they are about five percent of all carbon dioxide produced can be dissolved. Okay, in the 
blood plasma. Okay, so about 5% on it. So second, carbon dioxide can, I, I can enter into the red blood cells and bind directly with the terminal amino group, okay, or amino group of the hemoglobin, okay? So this form transport about 10% only. When carbon dioxide binds the hemoglobin, then it will form what we call the carbabino hemoglobin. Can you see that? So from the word carbabino, you know that it binds to the amino group or amino acid of the hemoglobin. So they don't bind to the heme group. Sir. Okay, always remember CO2 won't bind to the heme, heme group of the, uh, they won't, uh, they won't bind to the heme group of the hemoglobin. So the remaining 85% have to depend on this bicarbonate system. Okay, so binding of carbon dioxide into hemoglobin is reversible. So therefore, when it reaches the lung, the carbon dioxide can freely dissociate from the hemoglobin and expel from the body. So later, when you look at this uh, CO, carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide is irreversible. Okay? Carbon monoxide is irreversible, but carbon dioxide is reversible. So the third way or the majority way of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide molecule, about 85% are carried as part of the hydrogen carbonate or bicarbonate buffer system. I'll explain why it's called this buffer system. So in this system, carbon dioxide diffuses into the red blood cell. Okay, And what we do? We actually combine them with the water to form carbonic acid. Okay, with the with the presence of the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. Okay, carbonic anhydrase. So carbonic acid is an unstable intermediate molecule that immediately dissociated into the hydrogen carbonate or bicarbonate ions and also the proton hydrogen ions. So since the rate of conversion of carbon dioxide into the hydrogen carbonate ion is very, very high, so this reaction allowed for the continued uptake of CO2 into the blood down its partial pressure gradient. This is very important. Just now we say that why bicarbonate ion have to go out? Because when a bicarbonate ion go out from the red blood cell, then the equilibrium will push it to the left-hand side, not the reverse way, but forward way, the equilibrium. Okay? Chemical, equi chemical equilibrium will push these reactions towards the left hand side means that we, go, we are going to produce more and more hydrogen carbonate ions. Okay? So the dissociation of the carbonic acid also results in the production of H plus ions. If high concentration of H plus is produced, it can lower down the blood pH. However, hemoglobin now can bind to the free H plus to form hemoglobinic acid. Eh? So limiting the shift in the pH. So we don't actually uh, make the pH drop a lot. Are you clear? Because hemoglobin is going to uh, take this H, uh, H plus. Are you clear? So the newly synthesized hydrogen carbonate ion is transported out of the red blood cell into the liquid components of the blood, which is blood plasma, in exchange for the chloride ion. So in this term as chloride shift. So when the blood reaches the lung, the hydrogen carbonate ion is now transported back into red blood cell in exchange for the chloride ion again. So one in, one out. So the H plus ion dissociates from the hemoglobins and bind to the bicarbonate ions. So this produces the carbonic acid intermediates, then convert back to the carbon dioxide. And also this will be catalyzed by the carbonic anhydrase. So during exhalations, we will be able to remove the CO2. So what's, what is the functions of the chloride shift? Okay, so chloride shift is exchange the ion that take place in the red blood cell because when we have this intracellular bicarbonate ions increase, then we have to export the bicarbonate ion out and then take in the chloride intake, take in the chloride ions. So as bicarbonate ion move across this special ion channel, uh, exchange, um, sorry, ion exchange uh, channel, a chloride ion is brought into the cell. So it means that it's anti one CO, sorry, one bicarbonate ion move out one chloride ions move it, okay? So what is the, 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 the functions here? Because the influx of the chloride ion therefore help to prevent the overall charge inside the cells from become too positive because you continue to leak out the negative ion, then it become too positive. So the idea of chloride ion enter is to balance the charge, okay? Huh? So the presence of high partial pressure of CO2 cause the hemoglobin to release the oxygen, okay? Decrease affinity. Still remember in the ball shift, so PCO2 high, decrease the affinity. So how this can be achieved? 
So high partial pressure of CO2 are found in active right, respiratory tissue, which need the oxygen. So this high carbon dioxide concentration cause the hemoglobin readily combined with the hydrogen ions, forming the hemoglobinic acid. A high concentration of hydrogen ion in the blood lower down the blood pH. So hemoglobin now act as the pH buffer by removing the hydrogen ion from the plasma, therefore maintain the pH. But to do so, they have to release the oxygen. So therefore, we have the extra release of the oxygen. Okay. So another uh, another particle or another chemical compounds that can cause a similar effect as this uh, ball shift is this 2,3-BPG or we call it as a 2 3 bisphosphoglyceric acid. If you look at the, the figure 6.36, you can see that the black color line, this one is under normal, so without, okay, black color lines, without. 2,3 BPG. Okay, red color is the one that with 2,3 BPG. So can you see that the, the presence of this compound 2,3 BPG basically caused the graph to be shifted to the right. So when shifted to the right basically means that decrease the affinity. Okay, so the general idea here is with the presence of 2,3 BPG, so 2,3 BPG is going to cause the extra release of O2 from hemoglobin. So it means what? They decrease the affinity of hemoglobin for O2. Okay? So in this figure 6.37, we can clearly see, we can clearly see that how this 2,3 BPG cause the extra release, okay? Now, 2,3 BPG normally won't be released when your tissues have high uh, supply of the oxygen. So when our body have, uh, have su sufficient uh, oxygen supply, you won't see the 2,3 BPG being produced. But this 2,3 BPG will be released when our body experience hypoxia, means that not enough oxygen Okay, or during that anaerobic condition, sometimes you can see that this 2 3 BPG can further trigger the release of the O2. So now you can see that we have this we have oxyhemoglobins and deoxyhemoglobin. Can you see that? So when O2 bind to the binding site, this is called as a, rela a relaxed state. Relaxed state in this case, you can see that oxyhemoglobin is formed. Okay, it's relatively quite stable in this case, but when the presence of the negative effector here, for example, proton. Proton, actually, say, remember, we say that the presence of the proton trigger the release of the O2, okay, during this, what we call the ball effect or ball shift, correct not? Okay, now another compound here is 2,3-BPG. So this 2,3-BPG is something like the, what we call a illustrate effector. So it binds to a illustrate site, for example, can you see the allosteric site? So when this 2, 3 BPG bind to allosteric site, now you can see that it will convert the oxyhemoglobin to become deoxyhemoglobin at the tissue there. So this 2, 3 BPG going to bind to the allosteric site, expel out the oxygen. So therefore, our body will receive more oxygen when this 2, 3 BPG is present. Are you clear? So this interconversions. So means that in the lung, 2,3 BPG, no, L eh? lack of 2,3 BPG. So the chances for 2,3 BPG to bind to the allosteric site is lower. Therefore, oxygen can bind to the binding site. And then go to the, okay, try to imagine, go to our tissue. So in tissues, we have 2,3 BPG. So 2,3 BPG will do what? Bind to the allosteric site, release O2. So this way can help us to have more oxygen molecule to be used. Okay. Huh? So again, guys, spend about five minutes, complete the paragraph here. So we need to complete this uh, passage eh, by using the given term. So let us look at what is the answer or is the correct answer. So the oxygen binding curve for pure hemoglobin is uh, markedly different than oxygen binding curve for hemoglobin found with the red blood cell. So it means that if you take out the hemoglobin and do the experiment only, 
and also the hemoglobin that you put them into the red blood cell, then the oxygen dissociation curve will be quite different. Okay, so when these two curves are compared, the curve for hemoglobin in the red blood cell now shifted to the right. Okay, with respect to the pure hemoglobin curve. So it means that if I extract out hemoglobin only and do the experiment, you can see that they are located at the left-hand side. But if you put them into or you take them from the red blood cells, then you can see that they actually shifted to the right. Indicates that, okay, pure hemoglobin have actually much higher affinity for oxygen, correct or not? Because to the right, decreased affinity. To the left, higher affinity, okay? And they release much less of oxygen in exercising tissue as compared to hemoglobin in red blood cells. So if you look at it, if I use the pure hemoglobin only, it doesn't actually simulate the real conditions, cannot be real, because the real conditions is inside the red blood cell. So therefore, if you use the hemoglobin only, a pure hemoglobin, then affinity will be much more higher compared to one inside the red blood cell. So shifted in this case, okay? So this due to the presence of this compound called 2,3-BPG act as an allosteric effector. Okay, allosteric effector to hemoglobin. So this 2,3-BPG is a naturally occurring molecule produced as intermediate in the glycolysis process. And if you look at this, deoxyhemoglobin is in a 10 state. Deoxy means that when you remove the oxygen in the, this 10 state, it's a very unstable molecule. And this drive the equilibrium towards the relaxed state where the deoxyhemoglobin will not exist for long and majority of hemoglobin will be combined with the or bound to the oxygen. Now, this is very, very important. Now, understand the concept here. In the, okay, in the, what we call this, uh, tissue, in the tissue fluid, okay, this deoxyhemoglobin will be formed, cranot but they are very unstable. So once they go, go back to the lung, immediately they will take the oxygen really. Are you clear? So this is the idea, the interchange between the deoxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin, the tense state and the relaxed state. Are you clear? However, in the presence of this 2,3-BPG, this molecule will bind to the central pockets found in the hemoglobin, stabilizing the, eh, the tense states of hemoglobins and allowing it to exit without quickly converting into the relaxed state. So means that we don't want them to immediately you try to imagine huh, in the tissue. Now, what actually happens here in the tissues? When it releases, it may take back the oxygen huh, in the tissues. Huh? Try to imagine because the 10 states or deoxyhemoglobins, they are not stable. So means that once they release oxygen, they may bind back with the oxygen. So, but this thing, if with the presence of 2,3-BPG, then this 2,3-BPG will bind to the central pocket in the hemoglobin, the allosteric sites there, stabilizing the 10 state. So it means that we not only release the oxygen, we don't let oxygen to bind back, okay, to the uh, hemoglobin. Okay, uh? So that is by binding the hemoglobin, 2,3-BPG decreases the hemoglobin affinity for the oxygen. So shift the entire oxygen binding curve or this one, this oxygen curve to the right side. So this is what allowed the hemoglobin to act as an effective oxygen carrier in the body, unloading about 66% of the oxygen to the exercising tissues. Okay. So 2,3-BVG can help to prevent tissues hypoxia. Basically, we don't, uh, we don't let the tissue actually lack of the oxygen. In the condition of low tissue oxygen concentration, such as high altitude, airway obstructions or congestive heart failure will tend to cause the RBC to generate more 2,3-BPG because the change in pH and oxygen modulate the enzyme that make and degrade it. So the release it is potential by the ball effect again, okay? So in which hemoglobin binding affinity for oxygen is also reduced by lower pH and a higher concentration of CO2. So in tissues, the ATP demands oxygen rapidly consumed, in, which increase the concentration of H plus and the carbon dioxide. Therefore, the bot effect takes place. Hemoglobin is induced to release more oxygen to supply cells that need it. So what you need to know actually is very, very simple only for this part. So 2,3-BPG, what is their role? So with the presence of 2,3-BPG, they're going to decrease affinity. Of hemoglobin for 
O2. So means that O2 won't I mean, so bind to the hemoglobin so readily. So therefore, we can release O2 for respiring tissues. Okay, clear not so far, guys? So with this, I've done for the parts, okay, uh, relates to the CO2 transportations gear. So I off the record now.